Good afternoon, and welcome to the Ivan Allen Junior Prize for Social Courage. Please take your seats. We'll be starting momentarily. Thank you. Georgia Tech established the Ivan Allen Jr. Prize for Social Courage in 2010 to honor a proud alumnus and former Atlanta mayor who took a stand and made a difference. Funded by the visionary philanthropy of the Wilbur and Hilda Glynn Family Foundation, the prize recognizes people who have risked their careers and livelihoods, and even their lives, to bravely act to bring about change to make the world a safer place, to alleviate suffering, to advance democracy and equality, to promote human rights and human dignity. The prize honors their compassion, their refusal to quit, and their commitment not just to words but to action in the face of challenges that seemed insurmountable. Mayor Allen's leadership and his advocacy for civil rights during the 1960s endure as a model not only for the people of Atlanta and the South, but for the nation and the world. The prize that bears his name underscores Georgia Tech's mission of improving the human condition. It is a testament to the power of acting on moral principle for the betterment of our world. And it is a reminder and an inspiration that progress and service are more than just words. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Georgia Tech, the home of the uh, ACC men's basketball champions. <laughs> My name is uh, Angel Cabrera and I um, have the honor of serving as uh, president of Georgia Tech. And on behalf of our students, our faculty and staff, I would like to welcome all of you as we award the Ivan Allen Jr. Prize for Social Courage to Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci has served the American public for more than 50 years as part of the National Institutes of Health. He is one of the world's leading experts on infectious diseases and has worked for decades on the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of some of the most devastating diseases of our time. He has advised every American president since Ronald Reagan, bringing the voice of science uh, to important health decisions and uh, was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President George W. Bush. Dr. Fauci served on President Trump's coronavirus task force and now serves on the White House COVID-19 response team. As President Biden's chief medical advisor, he continues to help steer the nation through the current crisis. Despite tremendous public and political pressure, including harassment and death threats to, to him and to his family, he has shown an unwavering commitment to science-based guidance, and his voice has become one of the most trusted across the country. In recognition of his lifelong commitment to public health and courageous advocacy for science-based public health policy, we are proud to honor him with the Ivan Allen Jr. Prize for Social Courage. This prize was established to honor Georgia Tech alumnus and former Atlanta Mayor Ivan Allen Jr. Mayor Allen was a courageous leader who envisioned a truly transformative path for Atlanta, a city that meant so much to him. He had the courage to not only question and change his own views 
on race, but publicly and effectively advocate for the businesses and political establishments of his day to leave segregation behind and create a more just, equitable, and inclusive society in his hometown. This celebration, which is happening on what would have been Mayor Allen's 110th birthday this day, uh, brings us together to recognize transformational work that addresses some of the most complex challenges facing our world and to honor individuals who courageously seek and fight for social change, even if it puts their careers, their livelihoods, and at times their very lives in jeopardy. Today we will be joined by several distinguished speakers who together with Dr. Fauci will offer their insights about the public health challenge we face today and how we all can find our own social courage and act on it when the time comes. As part of the program today, we will hear from Dr. Rochelle Walensky the new director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We will also hear from our friend, Dr. Carlos Del Rio from Emory University and, and Grady Health, who is a courageous leader in his own right and a friend and admirer of Dr. Uh, Fauci and who's doing just a terrific job in, in this community to share also the voice of, of, uh, of science. We'll hear from my colleagues, Ann Kramer, retired IBM director of, uh, for corporate citizenship in the Americas, and two other colleagues who have played an important role, uh, both helping Georgia Tech go through this uh, unprecedented crisis, but also contributing to our very community. And those are Dr. Joshua Weitz and Dr. Pinar Kesnikocha. So thank you uh, to all our speakers today for joining us. The Ivan Allen uh, Junior Prize for Social Courage is, is made possible by the generous support of the Wilbur and Hilda Glenn Family Foundation. I also want to thank members of the Ivan Allen Family and the Ivan Allen Advisory Board for their continued support. Now we'd like to take just a moment and invite you to join us in viewing this video on the work and legacy of Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Anthony Fauci graduated first in his class from Cornell Medicine and then earned military service working for America's Public Health Service. Fauci became director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease in 1984 and has since led research efforts on everything from tuberculosis and HIV AIDS to emerging diseases like Ebola, Zika, and COVID-19. Fauci has advised seven different presidents on domestic and global health issues, and he was one of the principal architects of PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, a program that has saved millions of lives in the developing world. As the longtime chief of the Laboratory of Immunoregulation, Dr. Fauci has made massive contributions to clinical research, specifically in the field of the human immune response and developing treatments for immune-related diseases. Fauci is also one of the most often cited researchers on the planet, ranking in the top 1% of all authors in the fields of immunology and experimental medicine. Whether at a patient's bedside, in the lab developing treatments or sharing the most up-to-date information to the public. Dr. Fauci has served on the front lines of disease outbreaks in the U.S. for decades, a steadfast voice of science during some of the most significant public health crises in American history. As a trusted face, his unwavering guidance has helped lead our nation and the world. Innovation, commitment, courage. These are the legacies of Ivan Allen Jr., a man whose work and commitments led to extraordinary progress in, in this city that we call home. In accordance with Georgia Tech's mission to develop leaders who advance technology and improve the human condition, 
We give this prize in his honor by recognizing those around the world, like him, like you, who embody the best of those characteristics, even if it means risking everything. Dr. Fauci, Georgia Tech is honored to present you with the Ivan Allen Jr. Prize for Social Courage. In accepting this honor, you join a list of truly courageous individuals. We honor your exemplary career and your dedication in the fight against COVID-19. We thank you for your steadfast leadership so that we can have hope for ourselves, our families, our communities, our nation, and our world as we move forward. You are in fine company. Previous Ivan Allen Jr. Prize honorees include the late Congressman John Lewis, Dr. William Feige, who led the strategy to eliminate smallpox, African civil rights advocate Beatrice Tetwa, United Nations Ambassador and former Atlanta Mayor Andrew Young, activist Nancy Parrish, U.S. President Jimmy Carter and First Lady Rosalind uh, Carter, Charlene Hunter Galt and the late Dr. Hamilton Holmes, the first African American students enrolled at the University of Georgia and Senator, Georgia Senator Sam Nunn. In recognition of your courage, please accept this award from the entire Georgia Tech Yellow Jacket community. Thank you so much for that very kind and generous introduction, Dr. Cabrera, and warm greetings to all of you assembled for this event. Reflecting on the courageous civil rights leadership of Georgia Tech alum Ivan Allen Jr. and the principled lives of all of the distinguished people who've received this prize before me, I'm deeply honored to accept the Ivan Allen Jr. Prize for Social Courage with gratitude and profound humility. Thank you very much. The wrenching events that our country has witnessed lately remind us that we have much work to do as individuals and as a country to overcome social injustices. Importantly, social injustices lead to health disparities. As made plain by the COVID-19 pandemic, the adverse effects of health disparity, disparities most profoundly affect people of color. As a physician, scientist, and public health official, my main goal is to preserve and protect the health and welfare of all Americans. U.S. global leadership in science means my responsibility extends to people around the world. In important ways, my education has shaped my life's work. I was fortunate enough and privileged enough to attend the Jesuit high school and college. And during college, I pursued a dual major in the classics and in pre-med. The Jesuit environment promoted intellectual rigor, including precision of thought and economy of expression. It also impressed upon us the most important way of serving the greater good, which with my affinity for the sciences led me to my career in medicine. My exposure to humanities made me aware of health disparities at home and around the globe. One Jesuit precept we learned was always adhere to the truth, which has helped me preserve my integrity and also prove best for the people that I serve. Importantly, I have adhered to presenting science-based evidence and data as they are, no matter how inconvenient that truth might be. I can recall some episodes that I've had in my career in which choices may have called upon a certain degree of what one might call social courage. I was invited to brief President Ronald Reagan 
and Vice President George H.W. Bush about the HIV epidemic in the very early years of that pandemic. I told them the cold truth, realizing that they might either accept and respect me for what I've been telling them or get annoyed and never invite me back. However, good things came of that truth because this led to a warm and respectful relationship with the vice president who later became president, George H.W. Bush. He visited the NIH, understood the disease, and led to a relationship with his son, President George W. Bush. And so it was a typical example of although the truth was inconvenient, the truth was accepted by leaders of our country. And then during the ACT UP protests, again in the early years of HIV, I made a decision to listen to what these HIV patient advocates and activists had to say. At the time, my research community and the regulatory community was still living in what we would call an ivory tower at this time. Colleagues were afraid of letting patients become partners, but this model of partnership between physician and patient has now become the norm and community input is an important part of what we do. Finally, an example that falls more under the category of a moral imperative rather than moral courage was when I made multiple trips to Africa again in the middle years of the HIV AIDS pandemic. And I had the realization of the moral imperative of bringing life-saving antiretroviral drugs to those most in need through what became the PEPFAR program that I had the honor and the privilege of designing at the request of President George W. Bush. The West African Ebola outbreak of 2014 to 16 was important because of the fear that it instilled in people in this country, despite the fact that it was never really a major threat to this country. And I made a decision to become part of the NIH Clinical Center team that took care of Ebola patients, mostly Americans who were volunteering in West Africa who became infected. I made a decision to take care of them. And I also made a decision to diffuse the stigma associated with this disease by taking the opportunity to publicly throw my arms around and hug one of the patients upon her discharge, proving that we should not stigmatize people who have been infected with Ebola or that who took care of people infected with Ebola. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, keeping public health messages attuned to the scientific evidence and data and not being intimidated or pressured into agreeing with something that I did not think or believe to be true. And that continues to this day. And so thank you again for this distinguished honor. It has been an extraordinary privilege to serve as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases for now going on 37 years. And in that role, to have worked with seven presidential administrations, as well as thousands of incredibly talented scientists, clinicians, public health officials, and importantly, patients, to preserve, protect, and advance the health and the welfare of all Americans and people worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fauci, and, and, and congratulations. And thank you for those uh, meaningful uh, words that will be a source of inspiration 
for uh, many of us in this community. And um, of course, I, I, I want to offer my thanks again to Dr. Carlos Del Rio, who you will not uh, see today, but following uh, this Q&A uh, session, he will be on a panel here uh, with us, and, and I can't wait to continue the conversation that you and I are about to, uh, to start. And um, um, so first, uh, you know, we, we are going to spend some time with Dr. Fauci. And, and we appreciate your generosity with your time to have this, this conversation about uh, your career and thoughts on the current health crisis. You know, members of our student body, our faculty and staff have submitted questions and are excited to, to, to hear from you. So let me, I'll, I'll, I'll articulate some of these questions and others we have videos where uh, some of these uh, people will ask their own questions. Um, so to be a good scientist, one needs to be many things, right? One needs to be analytical, conscientious, undeterred, smart. Well, this year we have learned that one also may need to be brave. And there is a long history of bravery in science. What does it mean to you, this need to be brave in, in science? Well, um, Dr. Cabrera, in, in, the, in the current situation where we're living right now, I think the idea of bravery in science takes on a special connotation because of a strong and growing anti-science um, trend that we're seeing, not only in this country, but even worldwide, where there is in many respects a frank uh, denial of what is patently obvious from a scientific and public health standpoint. And I think we've seen that so clearly in the response of some individuals to the COVID-19 pandemic, it serves as a perfect example. So to me, bravery in science means to stick by the principles of what the data and the evidence tells you to do, to not pull back from that, to never compromise your integrity when you're dealing in a scientific situation, and to always, as I mentioned in my very brief uh, acceptance remarks, to make sure you always stick with the truth, however inconvenient or uncomfortable it means to some people. Because at the end of the day, the truth will always show. Thank you. We, we have a question from a, from a student. This will be also um, a Spanish exam for you. Hope you're ready for it. <laughs> Hola, mi nombre es Alejandro Da Silva. Soy una estudiante de tercer año de doctorado en bioingeniería. Y mi pregunta para usted, doctor Fauci, es: ¿Cuáles son los principios que lo llevaron a la posición en la que está hoy día y que lo separaron de sus colegas en su carrera profesional? So, Ale Alejandro is a bioengineering PhD student, and uh, of course, he wants the your, he wants career advice from you. If there are any principles that may have helped you throughout your career and that have in retrospect, led you to be where you are today? Well, thank, thank you for that question. It's a great question and it's meaningful to so many young people at that particular stage in their career. The, the principles that have guided me have always been to pursue what you feel passionate about, about what you really feel that you want to do and not what you think other people may want you to do or think they want you to do. That's the first principle. The other is keep an absolute open mind to opportunities that might almost accidentally put themselves in front of you. And if you are alert enough, you can then seize these opportunities. You wanna get a good background, a good education to get good qualifications that you need by training. But once you have that, you are gonna see, as I did in my own career, more often than not, the roads you follow are circumstances that you never would have predicted, but that just came in front of you as opportunities that will shape the direction of your career. Oh, thank you, thank you for, for that advice. Now, before the, the, the pandemic, uh, were there times in your career where you felt like you were taking great risk. I mean, you shared some of that insight uh, during your remarks, but uh, 
Did you even think of yourself as particularly brave when you got into, when you decided you were going to be a scientist? You know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm smiling when you, when you say that, Dr. Cabrera, because I certainly don't think upon myself at all as being brave. I just do what I feel I need to do, and I don't connect that with the concept of bravery. Um, I've made some decisions that in, in retrospect were a bit risky um, in the very much of the summer of 1981. I made a decision to completely turn around the direction of what was quite a successful career in medicine to pursue this very mysterious new disease that was appearing in our country, seemingly affecting a small number of mostly gay men. But I knew deep down that this was gonna be much, much greater a problem than just restricted to gay men or even a small number of individuals. And my mentors told me that I was making a mistake studying this unusual, somewhat bizarre new disease but nonetheless, I pursued ahead. And that has really been the defining element of my career has been HIV AIDS. We have another question from a Georgia Tech student, Kyra Halbert Elliott. You wanna play it? Hi, I'm Kira Halbert Elliott, a third year biomedical engineering major. Dr. Fauci, service can be infinitely rewarding, but it can also be extraordinarily draining. Can you elucidate how, over a lifetime of achievements and service, you have maintained your commitment to service? What moments inspired you? What moments shook your faith? Well, th th that's a, a, what's a seemingly a simple but a complicated question. So let me try and, and be brief in, in, in the answer. What, what keeps me on course and not burned out or not discouraged is focusing like a laser beam on the importance of the problem that you're facing and that you're trying to tackle. It could be an individual sick patient who you must devote all of your energy and all of your skills to taking care of, which I have done thousands of times in my career. It could be a particular problem, like a new outbreak, like Ebola or Zika or now COVID-19. So the idea of focusing on what you need to do really is, goes a long way in getting you to not focus on fatigue and feeling worn out or feeling discouraged. Just understand the enormity of what you do. Often you can get stressed by things that are beyond your control. I think this past year, what I've gone through, um, I mean, I think anybody who witnesses it would have to see it would be quite stressful. I, I took no great pleasure in having to be in conflict at times with the president of the United States. I mean, that is not something that I seek to do. It just sometimes is necessary because you have to stick with the truth and maintain your integrity. That it was not an easy thing to do, but I had to do it. So maybe uh, as a, as a follow-up to that, uh, obviously the, the first few months of the, of the response, and in some ways still uh, this day, that, but the, the first uh, phase of this response was extremely polarizing, even it became very, very political. And um, have you experienced that level of polarization over um, scientific fact and, and realities before, or um, maybe any any reflection that you have with from from this experience that hopefully teaches something for the future. You know, I have to say, Dr. Cabrera, that I have been through multiple stressful situations, mostly in the form of outbreaks. There was stigma, and there was some political issues related to other outbreaks. But I have never in my long, decades long experience ever seen the level of divisiveness that exists in the country today. 
where what should be normal, common sense, in some respects, no brainer type of public health issues have taken on a political connotation, which you don't need me to talk about. You just need to observe what is going on so clearly in the country today. That makes a lot of things difficult, but it is particularly uh, problematic when you're dealing with a public health measure in which there needs to be a uniformity of a consistent response based on fundamental sound public health principles. And when you have divergence from that because of the divisiveness that we have in society, that makes it quite difficult to do what you need to do to address something as formidable as this pandemic that we're dealing with. And as you, as you try to stay on, on message and, um, and have your, your voice heard, um, maybe any, any lessons from a standpoint of scientific communication or, or things that you've learned that, that worked well or didn't work as well, what, what can we learn from, from the, in, that, in that incredibly polarized right. environment that you just described? What, what can we learn? Yeah. Well, I think you mentioned the word communication, Dr. Cabrera. Communication is really very important uh, because when you have something as complex and as charged as this, you've got to be very consistent in being driven by the data. When the data change, as you learn more and more, you sometimes have to change your position, your guideline, your approach to something. So it isn't that you're changing your mind, it's that the data are changing and you have to stick with the data. When you communicate, I think it's really very important to know who your audience is and to know what the message is. Don't give a garbled message, be very straightforward in what you're talking about and as I always tell my fellows and students and others, if you're a scientist and you're communicating with the general public, the goal is not to show people how smart you are. The goal is for them to understand what you're talking about. So interestingly, uh, and by the way, we, we were having a conversation before the program started, which I suppose with my colleagues and, and Dr. Del Rio, we, we will continue later about this idea of, of being, how do you show confidence, which people are demanding, if you will, or, or, or needing in a situation like this, while at the same time being humble about what we know and what we don't know and, and realizing that the evidence may, may change, that will, of course, change. Any, any advice on that? No, does it exist? Yeah. yeah. It's just what you said. You've got to be modest enough and humble enough to know that you don't know everything you need to know at any given time, particularly when you're dealing with a dynamic situation. And a pandemic like we are all living through is a very dynamic, fluid situation. If you're talking about something that's static, then you could be very firm and definitive about things because they're not going to change. But when you're dealing with a fluid and dynamic situation, you've got to be flexible enough to when you are con when you are confident of the data to present it in a way that instills confidence in the people that you're talking to. When you do not know all of the information, you've got to be very clear that what you are giving is something based on an opinion and not necessarily on sound scientific data. Always distinguish and clarify what you are talking about and what the basis is of what you're saying. Yes, and I guess as faculty members, especially at the beginning of our careers, uh, many of us have been really um, worried about that one question that we don't know how to answer, right? And, and what is that, that way of addressing that? And sometimes um, we probably dread that moment, not realizing that something as easy as saying, I don't know, <laughs> would probably do the trick. 
Is that right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you should say that every once in a while just to get just to keep it fluid in your lips. There's nothing wrong with not knowing <laughs> at all. We'll practice that. We'll practice that. Uh, let us go back to there. There is another uh, question from a member of the of the Georgia Tech community that we pre-recorded. Hi, Dr. Fauci. My name is Nettie Brown. I'm a third year biomedical engineering PhD student here at Georgia Tech. And my question is, there's been a lot of recent discussion around vaccine hesitancy in the black community based on medical mistreatment in this country. Yet recent polls show that white Republicans have more vaccine hesitancy. This is probably due to politics. So my question is, since they are a larger demographic, how should we push white Republicans to push towards getting vaccines to help our nation move forward? Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, Nettie. Th th that's a really important question. It's really kind of puzzling how you have groups of individuals who seemingly, based on uh, what's political ideology, are against vaccination. I don't understand that very well. When you have hesitancy in the African-American community and the brown and black community, you respect that hesitancy because it's based on the fact that in reality that demographic group has been mistreated historically by federally sponsored medical programs we all know about the shameful situation with tuskegee and even beyond that so when i deal with african americans i show respect for their hesitancy and respect for their concern. And then after I make it clear that I understand why they are hesitant, I go through trying to figure out what is it about vaccines for COVID-19 or vaccines in general that make them hesitant. One of the most common one is you went really very quick. I thought that it takes years to make vaccines. You did it in less than a year. Was this cutting corners and is it not safe? And you explain that the speed is not related at all to cutting corners, but is a reflection of the extraordinary scientific investments that were made and the exquisite nature of the scientific advances that have taken place years before we started working on this vaccine. The other thing is, are we sure it's safe and effective? And we talk about the independent bodies, like the data and safety monitoring boards that independently look at the data and tell the public as to whether or not it's safe and effective. When they understand that, it's very interesting that you're seeing less and less hesitancy. I worry more about getting equity in access to vaccines for brown and black people because we want to make sure that they do have equity in access. With regard to the question about the reluctance of a disturbing proportion of Republicans of not wanting to get vaccinated, I really would like to learn a little bit more about that from them, about what is it about this particular vaccine or getting vaccinated against a life, with a life-saving intervention, what about that do they have a problem with? And then and, and hopefully we can get into some sort of a productive dialogue about that. That might be a, a good advice for us in our own personal lives, because all of us confront those uh, conversations very often, right? With, with family members, with, with neighbors who may express that reluctance or hesitancy and, and hesitancy, and we don't know exactly where that might come from. Sometimes we have a sort of an immediate reaction of, of trying to, to, to preach or to, you know, sort of dump all the arguments. And, and that, in my experience, hasn't worked very well. And maybe, maybe this idea that you're proposing, that, do you think it, it would work in that person-to-person -person conversation or just trying to ask, what is it that makes yes. you wary? Of course. I think that's the only, if you confront someone, that's the easiest way of turning them off even more. So you've got to try and reach out to them and have them explain and try and perhaps to go back and forth with them about why you feel that the risk benefit ratio very, very strongly weighs in favor of the benefit.
So, so um, I, there was a very interesting article in the Washington Post recently about um, uh, the many people who sort of take a selfie when they're doing the vaccine and they post it online. And some people get upset, say, why do you take a selfie and whatever, and then some people is like, well, actually, if, if it encourages others to, to take it. I'm very excited because um, I'm planning to take my, my vaccine this week. And, um, and I was wondering, I mean, since, you know, I have a, a public job, should I, should I document that and share it and, and, and use social media and, and, and tell people, hey, I'm taking the vaccine, I trust it, I think it's safe, I think it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's very important for my health, for the people around me. What, what, what shall I do? You're my communications well, advisor all of a sudden. <laughs> you know, I would suggest that you seriously consider doing that because as the president of a prestigious university, I think that there is going to be a substantial number of people who could be influenced by seeing you in a leadership role do that. So I think that would be, well, I did that myself. I, I took, I had the press take a picture of me getting vaccinated at a time when there was even more concern on the part of people, whether it's safe. Now that there have been over 107 million vaccinations given in this country uh, with 10% or 12% of the country fully vaccinated and over 20% having at least one vaccine, people feel much more comfortable about it, but back then they didn't. And for that reason, I did have a picture of a nurse putting a needle in my arm, giving me a vaccine. Well, and, and then the, the, the other part of this interesting conversation that we're all having is, um, uh, well, first of all, we, I don't even know if it's appropriate when in casual conversations we ask, have you been vaccinated or not? And then if you ask the question, then the next question is, which vaccine did you take? Right? And, um, and does it matter, first of all, that, does it matter what vaccine do we take? You know, it does not, because we have now uh, three vaccines, Moderna, Pfizer, and J&J, &J, who have been given emergency use authorization on the basis of a very high degree of efficacy in preventing mild to moderate disease and a very, very good track record of preventing severe disease, including hospitalization and death. You shouldn't be trying to compare one with the other. The only way you can adequately do that, if you, if you compare them in a head-to-head -head comparison in the same clinical trial, and that wasn't done. So just know that we are very fortunate to have three highly efficacious and safe vaccines. So my recommendation is go to a facility near you or one that calls you and says, you're now eligible to get vaccinated and whatever they happen to have, take it because it's important, first of all, to get vaccinated, not to wait two weeks or a month for the one that you think may or may not be better. Take the one that's made available to you. Although, although if, if they give me the Moderna, they gave me two shots, Johnson & Johnson only one shot. Shouldn't I want the one that gives me two shots? Seems like I'm getting more stuff. Well, no, no, no actually, that, that's a good question. If you prefer to have a single shot and you go to a facility that has both of these available, the mRNA and the J&J, &J, you could say, I would prefer to have the J&J &J because I only want one shot. There's nothing wrong with that. Got it. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, let me let, let's talk a little bit about 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 science because, you know, we, we we've had that experience. Uh, you, you know, we we are a, a pretty research intense institution at, at Georgia Tech, um, through a whole host of disciplines, including by by the way in in in, uh, in biomedical bioengineering, um, biomedical engineering. We have this great partnership with with our friends at um, at Emory and. But, but a lot of the science, the, it's, it, it builds gradually over time, right? I mean, the, this, this amazing technology around messenger RNA that has given us these two vaccines in, in record time, which uh, it's uh, just unbelievable, the technology. But, but as you mentioned earlier, I mean, there's been 
years and years and hundreds of people and hundreds of doctoral dissertations and postdocs and papers and work building up all that research until all of a sudden one day all that knowledge was called to pretty much save us, right? Would a message maybe to, to, uh, to, to folks here in places like Georgia Tech um, who are studying science, who have decided or are considering getting a, a doctorate in science, and who are gonna be working on, you know, small pieces of bigger puzzles. Anything you have to, to share with them? Oh, absolutely. And, and I, I do this very frequently with, with people here at the NIH and others throughout the country, is that if you are part of a scientific enterprise, even though you may be working on a very small element of that, you should realize if you go to 40,000 feet and look at virtually every important biomedical intervention is always rooted in fundamental basic research that at the time seemingly had little bit to do with what it ultimately had a major impact on. And there are so many, many examples of that. People working on receptors on the cell for lipids and triglycerides and other uh, areas uh, and, and other uh, uh, elements of, of the body's ability to get involved in metabolic processes led to drugs that have important impact on diminishing the risk of cardiovascular disease, the lipid lowering agents. You know, people like David Baltimore and Howard Temin working on this reverse transcriptase enzyme years and years ago, what impact that ultimately had on molecular biology and understanding HIV. People in the laboratory working on RNA, realizing that messenger RNA can actually be a platform for vaccinology. We could go on all day giving examples of people working on very, very specific issues that ultimately get translated into something that could be transforming when it comes to personal and global health. Yeah, in, in our uh, experience this year at Georgia Tech, and, and I'm sure it's not the exception in, in many other institutions like ours across the country, across the world, that they've, I'm sure, experienced similar things. But very early on, our, our faculty, some of the ones who will follow this conversation on a panel, um, they came to us and said, listen, you know, to be safe, we've done all the statistics and we need to test everybody every, every week. I say, okay, well, that's an interesting, that, and, and that's a very interesting idea, except that we don't have a medical school. We haven't done a clinical test in our life, never. How are we gonna go from that? I do the numbers, you know, how are we gonna do that? They said, well, we, we can figure this out. Um, then I, you know, my concern was, again, if we use the nasal swab, um, I haven't had the pleasure, but I understand from many others that once you do it once, you don't just repeat it for pleasure. Um, so I said, no worries, we're, in very short time, my colleagues came together, they designed this, you know, way of extracting RNA from saliva, which my understanding was not, is not the easiest thing to do, in a massive way, they scaled it up, they used this double pooling process, so we, the, whatever capacity we had, we could do uh, many, many more tests by double pooling, and I don't know, they've done some crazy stuff. Uh, they, they programmed a, a, a platform, oh, this is not just a plug, it is a plug, I'm very, very proud of what they did. <laughs> uh, but, but it is to say that this experience, honestly, showed, first of all, brought all these disciplines together and gave us this incredible sense of impact. What we do matters. That you may not realize it at the time when you're working every day in the lab, but when things got really ugly and scary, science and technology was all we had. And it was, in, somehow, I'm, I, this is more of a, an open reflection, not necessarily a question, but, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we keep the spirit? There are lots of things of 2020 that we want to leave behind as fast as we can, but how do we keep some of these profound lessons that we've 
learn this year and keep them going. Anyway, don't mean to. I guess I'm too late. Uh, but uh, if you have any thought about about that, you know, yes, I, I, I I'm very uh, impressed and 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 feel very positive about what you just said. <laughs> so you semi apologize for it. You shouldn't because that's exactly the spirit that you really want to foster in people who are in science. It's it's exactly what you said. If you look at what is rescuing us from a public health challenge, the likes of which we haven't seen in over 102 years, it really is the science. It absolutely is the science, just as you describe how people can get involved, put themselves, put the, everybody together as a team working to solve problems that really didn't exist a year ago. And yet you have to adapt to that. So to me, that's one of the beauties of science. Again, the mystery of it, the solving of the mystery and the impact that you can have, enormous impact involving the saving of literally millions of lives. Yeah, and, and it, is, it is fascinating. And one, one of the ideas that we're working on and our, our uh, executive vice president of research and our provost are in attendance and, and several of our faculty leaders were thinking about even maybe creating a, a, a center around a sort of a rapid, rapid response center. Like, can we, can we develop techniques to sort of deploy rapidly uh, science and technology for things that can, uh, may come our way, which we cannot even predict today? So it's fascinating. Um, we, we have a, a, a vaccine question from a faculty member. Dr. Fauci, thank you for your service to our country. I'm Vinayak. I'm an assistant professor in the College of Sciences in the schools of chemistry and biochemistry and biological sciences. My question to you is the following. COVID-19 is caused by a virus that mutates. If so, are we looking at a vaccine shot yearly, just like we do for the flu? And if yes, can the COVID-19 vaccine and the flu vaccine be combined in a single shot? Thank you. Well, we certain that's an excellent question often asked. It is entirely conceivable that if we have the continual emergence of new variants, that we may need to either boost with wild type to give a bigger and larger response of antibodies that could spill over and uh, affect the variant. Of course, we know that our vaccine right now is very good against the 117 variant, not necessarily as good against the South African 351 variant, but we may actually need to intermittently boost. If that is the case, and it turns out, and that's a big if because we don't know, but if it does turn out that we need to boost intermittently, it is entirely conceivable that you would want to combine that with an influenza vaccine on a yearly basis. I hope we don't have to do that. I hope we can control and ultimately crush this particular infection so that we essentially eliminate it the way we've done with the eradication of smallpox, the elimination of polio throughout most of the world, and the elimination of measles in most of the developed countries in the world. But we don't know. We don't have enough information right now to know whether or not we're going to have to come back with booster shots, which is the reason why we follow it so very carefully, literally in real time. And uh, we have another uh, question from a member of the Georgia Tech community. Do you want to play that? Hi, Dr. Fauci. My name is Jathan Caldwell, and I'm the external vice president of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers here at Georgia Tech. My question for you is, with healthcare in the United States still perpetuating one of the greatest areas of inequity for communities of color, where do you see the most opportunity for progress? Thank you. Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question that we deal with literally on a daily basis because as with other diseases, this has done this very much by shining a very bright light on the disparities that we see among brown and black people and other minorities. We see it with COVID-19, not only in the incidence of infection, but also the fact when individuals become infected because of the increased incidence and prevalence of the comorbidities 
associated with demographic groups like African Americans, Hispanics, Native American Pacific Islanders, they have a greater chance of having a severe outcome of their infection, namely hospitalization and death. So there are things we can do right now by increasing the equity and eliminating the disparity of accessibility to vaccines, to testing, to health care. But when I look at the problem, which has been around literally for decades and decades and decades, you don't eliminate the social determinants of health overnight. You have to have a decades long commitment that you are not going to allow these disparities to remain the way they are right now. And again, you can't turn a light switch on and off with this. These are things that brown and black people face from the time they're born. Availability of proper diets, economic situations, situations where they live, the kinds of work they do. We've got to make sure that those social determinants of health in many respects are equalized so that decades from now, we don't have African-Americans with a higher degree of diabetes, obesity, hypertension, chronic renal disease, chronic liver disease. Those are not racially determined. They're determined by the social determinants of health. So I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. Rochelle Walensky is already um, available in, pardon me? She's on I see her like, somewhere. Ah, you see her. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Walensky, uh, I always joke that I had a poor sense of timing uh, when I accepted to become president of Georgia Tech uh, four months before the pandemic hit. Uh, I think you beat me in terms of, uh, of timing. Of course, uh, Dr. Fauci had no choice. He already had his job when the pandemic hit. Uh, but Dr. Walensky uh, agreed to serve as the new director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And um, she is, in, 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 and we're very appreciative for her to take the lead in such a crucial organization, just in absolutely the most important time. Uh, she is a physician scientist as well, who also serves as the administrator for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Um, I, I, I thank uh, Dr. Walensky for joining us today. We're glad to have you join our discussion. We're very excited to hear your point of view from your vantage point at the CDC. Oh, we may have lost her. We let, we let our, the, the, the technology genies fix the technology. And since we're Georgia Tech, I'm sure we can do that. We'll fix this. Um, but I, I do have another question that I had for, uh, for you, um, which is especially the, the, uh, the onset of when we were in the, I guess, in the, the darkest days in last, last summer and uh, at, least, at least here as we were getting ourselves organized, it seemed very hard to create an understanding of the importance of community health to individual safety and, and economic security. There was the sense that either you had to be for the economy or you had to be for, for health. I mean, we sort of got stuck in these very interesting, what I consider to be false dichotomies, but I, I couldn't sort of somehow figure out how to get us away from that. Um, why was it so hard to connect personal safety, community safety, economic security? Well, in reality, it is a difficult issue. Uh, so putting aside the divisiveness, which I mentioned a bit ago, and just look fairly in a way of that tension between wanting to do the best for public health, but doing it in a way that if it is persistent over time, you are going to have a negative impact on the economy. Now, if you do that for a couple of weeks or a month, it's not going to have a significant impact. But the extraordinary nature of this outbreak required not only us here in the United States, but virtually every country in the world to essentially shut down, which if done over a prolonged period, 
has a very negative effect, not only on the economy, but also on things like schools and having children not being able to safely go to school. So those are the things that it's, it's a tension that you have to deal with. And I see Dr. Walensky back with us that she and I are challenged by that literally every single day because we're constantly being asked about that balance between preserving the public health tenets, the masking, the physical distancing, the avoiding crowds versus what impact closing down certain things has on the economy. And you've got to make sure you preserve the public health at the same time that you're sensitive as to what you're doing, the impact on society. And here she is. I'm so glad to see her. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Walensky, I'm sorry that I think you missed my introduction. It was wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Uh, other than I question your sense of timing for uh, <laughs> taking on this job, but we welcome you to, to Atlanta and we celebrate that you agreed to take the lead of this organization at this absolutely essential time. And I know you, you, you wanted to, um, uh, to share a few thoughts with us and we're very appreciative that you join us uh, today. So please go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the technical challenge. Thank you so much, Dr. Cabrera. I am so happy to join in this well-deserved recognition of my colleague, my mentor, my hero in truth, and my oh Gosh, I, we were about to hear the, let's give it a second, let's give it a second. I might need to recruit Dr. Del Rio to join me here. Just warning you, Carlos. Let's give her a second. It's, um, by the way, it's, it's fascinating because uh, as people like Dr. Walensky are moving into, into Atlanta, and um, in fact, uh, I just said hello earlier to uh, uh, Paige Alexander, the new head of the, oh, you're, you're there, Paige, uh, the new head of the Carter Center. And he's like, we haven't even had a chance to, to meet in person and to create the, the community that, we, um, that is so, so essential. So uh, anyway, we're, we're, we're gonna find ways to start building community and, and to, and to welcome Dr. Walensky as she deserves. Um, the, the other thing, by the way, uh, which I, uh, I'll give you a good reason to come in person, Dr. Fauci. My, I, I have an excellent uh, intelligence service here at Georgia Tech. And uh, my understanding is that you love a good hot dog. <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, I don't know if you, a baseball game. you do. Okay. Well, I don't. I don't know if you're aware that uh, we have the the world famous Varsity, the home of the best chili dog in the galaxy, is within walking distance from this venue. So what I can tell you is that we will. Uh, we. I promise you that whenever we can have you in person to come to Atlanta, uh, I owe you that one. It's actually a terrific place. I'm convinced. Was, was, it, was, it, was my intelligence correct or, or, or did I miss it? No answers. Okay, so um, we, we I, let me, let me uh, perhaps, there's another question that we have for you that was, uh, that was taped earlier from, um, uh, from the Georgia Tech community. Maybe we'll go to that now from Aaron Levin, see if we can play that. Dr. Fauci and Dr. Walensky, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Aaron Levine, and I'm a faculty member in the School of Public Policy. One of the striking realities of the pandemic is how it's highlighted existing disparities in our society, with, for example, blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans dying from COVID-19 at much higher rate, rates than white Americans. And now it appears some of these inequities are appearing in the vaccination data. My question is, what can we do to prioritize vaccination among those most affected by the pandemic? 
Yes, thank you for that question. And that is something we are paying very strict attention to is to get the equity such that we completely eliminate this disparity of access. And here are some of the things that the president himself has spoken about explicitly, putting up community vaccine centers as well as community health centers and making sure that they are equitably distributed in locations which have a high density of a demographic group such as African-Americans, Hispanics, and other minorities. To get vaccine doses to pharmacies that are located in areas that have a high concentration of this demographic groups. To make sure we have mobile units to get to poorly accessible areas that are very often disproportionately populated by African-Americans and Hispanics. And finally, to get more vaccinators, be they military, retired physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers, to make sure we can get out into the community and get these people vaccinated so that you don't have a disproportionate number of them being unvaccinated, which is completely unacceptable. So those are the kind of things that we're doing because what you asked is a very, very important question. We do not want to have health disparities be translated into lack of access to the vaccines that were available for them. Very important question and very important point. All right, well, we have one, one last question from, uh, uh, from a student, from uh, Lydia. If you wanna play that, please. Hi, Dr. Fauci. My name is Lydia Wiederholt, and I'm a second year public policy major. I wanted to know, based on your experience with the COVID-19 pandemic and your work with the HIV and AIDS epidemic, what do you feel our country and world should do to better prepare for similar health challenges in the future? Thank you. Thank you very much. That, there are several things that need to be done at the global and domestic level. At the global level, we have to strengthen our, our security network, the global health security network, where you have communication, transparency, and cooperation among all countries of the world in order to be able to detect outbreaks at the very early stages. You have to build up the public health system that we've let essentially go to some form of attrition over decades. We need to rebuild that. And we also have to make investments not only in public health infrastructure, but in scientific basis. For example, the things that got us the vaccines that we have right now. So it's an investment both at the scientific level and at the public health level, both domestically and internationally. All right, good timing, <laughs> Dr. Walensky. <laughs> I hope we figured it out already. Go. I'm nothing if not tenacious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, thank you for not giving up on us. And uh, the floor is the floor is yours. Thank you again, Dr. Cabrera. And I am so happy to join you in this well-deserved recognition of my colleague, my mentor, my hero in truth, and my friend. On, the, on behalf of all of us at CDC, I extend hearty congratulations to you, Dr. Fauci. We consider you a member of our, our extended family, and I can think of no one more deserving than the, of the Ivan Allen Jr. Prize for Social Change than Anthony Fauci. This prize in honor of the late mayor and Georgia Tech alum perfectly captures Tony's resolve during the COVID-19 pandemic. He's been a rock of principle through incredibly challenging circumstances. Throughout his unprecedented time in our history, Tony has become known as America's doctor because he's done something bold and audacious. Simply put, he's told the American people the truth, even when it was inconvenient to do so. He's spoken to us in simple, straightforward language with his characteristic Brooklyn accent that reminds me of my own mother, <laughs> using every possible platform available. 
He's become a reassuring presence in otherwise uncertain times and a voice of reason and common sense. Although he's become famously ubiquitous during the COVID-19 pandemic, those of us in the field of infectious disease world have known him to be a steady drumbeat of truth throughout his industrious, in, illustrious career. Um, I told Tony this, this anecdote the last time I introduced him when he gave medical grand rounds at Mass General. I can vividly remember the first time I met Dr. Fauci. I was giving my first oral presentation at the retrovirus conference and Dr. Fauci came up to meet me afterwards, shook my hand. Um, I was shaking. I shook his hand and then I turned to a colleague and I said, I'm never washing that hand again. Um, and that was from an infectious disease doctor. We in the field of infectious disease are not at all surprised that he has risen to the forefront in this time of crisis. He has done so so many times before. During the HIV AIDS crisis of the 1990s, as I was starting my own medical career working in hospital wards in Baltimore, he was leading the revolution to treatment. In fact, and he just told you this story, he opened the door to a new paradigm of patient advocacy and giving community a voice. When AIDS patients and their loved ones were protesting in die-ins outside his office at NIH in the 1980s, Tony's response was, please let them in. I want to hear what they have to say. This moment of openness, this moment of humanity, changed the course of advocacy and health and set the stage for having community and patient members on guidelines panels and advisory committees. It is such a critical voice that we listen to every day now because of that one act from Tony. Since those dark days when AIDS was a certain death sentence, we have witnessed the evolution of a deadly disease become a chronic one, where people not just manage but thrive, thanks in large part to the efforts of Dr. Anthony Fauci. Any infectious disease has a worthy opponent in Tony because he never gives up. He never gives in, and it is my privilege and honor to work alongside him now on the White House COVID-19 response team. He's truly deserving of this award, and now I look forward to joining the conversation. Thank you. Oh, Congratulations thank you. to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Walensky. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> so, um, well, I mean, just the way uh, you felt when you met Dr. Fauci, I think that that reflects the way many of our students would look up to you, Dr. Walensky, in your current <laughs> responsibility. So, so, um, so what would be, um, uh, both, this is a question for both of you. What's your charge to this new generation of, um, of students, again, at Georgia Tech, but in institutions around the world, who may be studying basic science, or they may be studying bioengineering, or, or, or computer science, or public policy, um, or, or any other area based on what we have learned. What's your, what's your charts? I mean, you're, you are our, our, our heroes. We look up to you. We, we, we have, so what, what is the charts that you have for this generation, this new generation? Go ahead, it's Michelle. A very simple, very simple. <laughs> All right. You know, um, I am personally an infectious disease doctor because I was motivated by people who were dying in front of me in the mid-1990s. Um, because of HIV and AIDS. And I would say um, I can imagine this generation and, the, and your students um, will and should be motivated by this period of time and what is happening in this period of time. And it's a coalescence of, um, of a pandemic and people dying in that pandemic and true inequities and in how we care for people in our society and, and how health has, is, is so disparate. And so I would say um, to be inspired. Um, I am going to spend the rest of my career trying to do good in global health. I'm gonna spend the next few years getting us out of this pandemic. I hope it won't take that long. And to then make up for so much of the collateral damage that has happened because of this pandemic. Um, but the health inequities have taken, um, taken decades and centuries to occur, and it is not necessarily going to be me that is going to um, be the, it, it won't end with my career. It, it has to end with, with young people being motivated by seeing what has um, happened during this pandemic and, and working to get us all um, uh, improve health for, for the whole world um, and, and to solve some of these inequities that have happened. Thank you so much. And you, Dr. 
Uh, yeah, well, certainly uh, to just underscore and agree totally with what Dr. Walensky has said, but you know, for the students of Georgia Tech, listen to what, what Dr. Walensky had said, but also for your own personal feeling of what you do. Not every scientist at Georgia Tech is gonna be a biological scientist because you go well beyond biology. Just the idea of the field of science. Dr. Walensky and I get our thrill in the discovery and the implementation of things that maybe were not known 10 or 15 years ago and applying it to health. As a scientist, be it in the biological sciences, the life sciences, the physical sciences, the idea of discovery, of, of learning something that maybe was never fully appreciated before is such an extraordinary uh, positive feeling. Uh, we get it when we take care of a patient and we see the patient get better. We get it when we see something happen, for example, having an outbreak turn the corner and come down. Those of you in other areas of science are gonna get the same sort of a thrill when you do something that advances your own individual field. So I just can't think of anything more exciting than being in the field of science, whatever area of science you're in. If it suits you to be in science, there's nothing more exciting in my mind than that. So go for it. Thank you both. And, and, and Dr. Walensky, just uh, I was I was um, um, joking earlier when I said talked about your poor sense of timing, but actually, um, when you were offered this position, which I know from a from a professional standpoint must have been uh, the, the the an honor and an honor of a, of a of a lifetime and a career, but but when you saw how hard it was for people like Dr. Fauci to stick to truth, to be that voice of science, and when you saw some of the reactions that he was getting, that must have given you some pause. So we, 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 um, we had lots of questions for Dr. Fauci earlier about his sort of source of courage. Where did you get yours to say, yes, I'm up for the challenge, bring it on. Um. <laughs> I'm not sure it went exactly like that. <laughs> you know, um, I, when I received the phone call, um, I was surprised, I have to admit. I, I wasn't expecting the phone call saying, come lead the CDC. But, but um, you know, what, I, what went through my mind is somebody feels like I can be helpful in making a difference here. And um, the answer can't be no, because we're in a really bad spot. And if I can be helpful to make a difference, then that's my job. That's what I have to do. Um, anybody, I had a wonderful, I have a wonderful female mentor who said, any next job that you're not um, too scared of, a little bit scared of, isn't big enough for you. Um, so I was a little bit scared. <laughs> I remain a little bit scared. Um, but in fact, this is a big job and we have a lot of hard work. I have an incredible mentor in Dr. Fauci who's been, who's been uh, helping me through it and an incredible team at CDC. I also um, have been very clear and was very clear when I started that um, they were going to get my honest opinion whether or not they liked it um, and that they were going to, uh, and then I wanted to be sure that science was going to be leading the way and that I was going to be able to convey that science. So with that, um, with that acknowledgement and that um, support from the administration, recognizing that, that I had the permission to let science lead the way um, and that in fact they endorsed it, um, and with the knowledge that, that people around me were going to support me and that um, that someone out there thought I could make a difference and make things better then the answer was an easy one well thank you thank you so much I how I wish I could be a fly on the wall when the two of you meet by yourselves <laughs> to discuss what's going on and uh, I won't uh, make you replicate uh, those conversations <laughs> here but if there is something that you would like to ask each other uh, for the pleasure of the rest of us, this might be a good moment. <laughs> or any closing comments, just to make it a little easier. Any closing comments that each of you may have. And I'll start with you, Dr. Walensky. So we'll give the last word to Dr. Fauci. Um, you know, what I've been charging my team with is um, to ask the hard questions, to um, make sure, are, are we asking the most important scientific questions 
to challenge the norm and say, is this the best that we can do and what is getting in our way so that we can actually do things better. Um, we're spending an extraordinary amount of time on, um, on how we reach hard to reach populations and how we, how we um, achieve access, proper access. I keep using the word sticky. I wanna make sure that as we do that, our actions are sticky so that we can go back and reach those populations for blood pressure control, for many other things, for, for, um, for uh, access in, in all areas of health and society. And so um, I would just say, um, ask the big questions, um, pursue what, what uh, keeps you up at night because um, you, you want to pursue that big scientific question. And um, I'm just so very grateful for the team of incredible scientists I have around me. And um, that very much includes and is led by Dr. Fauci. Well, well thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cabrera. I, I just would like to, to close my own comments with saying I, I very much appreciate having been chosen as the winner of the Ivan Allen Prize for Social Courage for this year. But whenever you get a prize that calls you out as an individual, you absolutely, at least I know, and I sincerely mean this, all it does is remind me of the extraordinary group of people that I'm surrounded by, that I deal with every day, including and particularly Dr. Walensky has been very generous in her praise of me, but she is, by anybody who has anything to do with her, knows that already she's emerged as a superstar in this endeavor that we have. She's at an organization that's an extraordinary organization. I mean, the CDC, who over the last year has taken some hits, is a phenomenal organization. We are lucky in this country to have the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention who are leading us now towards the end game of getting out of this pandemic. The same holds true for all of my colleagues at the National Institutes of Health. I mean, I get a lot of attention, but there are thousands of my colleagues who are there doing what it takes to get the job done, not only at the NIH, but the grantees and contractors who are NIH grantees, of which Dr. Walensky was one not too long ago. That's the team that I think our country needs to realize that you may see one or two of us around, but the fact is that there are thousands of us at the CDC, at the NIH, at other organizations that are really pulling to get the country out of this terrible outbreak that we're in. So I feel very privileged to be a small part of that extraordinary team. And including, including what Rochelle mentioned, the amazing team we have now at this administration, the medical team that we deal with every single day, literally every single day, is both a pleasure and an honor to do that. So I feel very, very good about what's going on. So thank you for well, giving I, me the opportunity I, to make those comments. Thank you. Thank you both. And, and please know that as, uh, as scientists, as, as researchers, um, we respect you, we appreciate you both. Um, we need you to be widely successful. Um, you know, there's a bright light at the end of the tunnel, but we're still in it. Um, and, um, and, and we're here, we're here to help. Dr. Walensky, we owe you a warmer, more personal welcome to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we, are, we will plan something uh, fun for you. Uh, Dr. Fauci, we owe you that uh, world famous hot dog when we can uh, arrange your next trip to Atlanta. And, um, but again, uh, congratulations on uh, Dr. Fauci and thank you for a lifetime of social courage from which we're all benefited. Hearing your story and your insights have left me, all of us, really feeling encouraged, inspired, and optimistic. We're so grateful for the time we've had with you today and look forward to a day when we can gather in person. Thank you both very, very much for your time today. We much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and now uh, for the uh, remainder of the program, we are honored uh, today to, to be, um, in, to, to have three incredible um, 
uh, four experts, one moderating the other three, um, for which I'm sure uh, they have been as inspired as I have been uh, by, by the remarks from Dr. Uh, Fauci and then from, uh, by Dr. Walensky, and I really can't wait to hear um, their reflections on what we just heard. Uh, the moderator is Ann Kramer, who's a retired, as I mentioned, IBM director of corporate citizenship for the Americas. She's currently a senior consultant at uh, Cosgrove and Associates, where she helps nonprofit clients strengthen their leadership um, and, and engage volunteers and do their, their work better. In 2020, she received the Atlanta Business Chronicle's first corporate social responsibility lifetime achievement award and was named to Georgia Trends Georgia Hall of Fame. So I'm going to ask her, but also the panelists, if you want to start making your way to, uh, to, to, to the stage while I continue to introduce you. Yeah, if you don't mind. So um, the panel, thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. Um, also includes our uh, dear friend, Carlos Del Rio from Emory University, as you know. Uh, he's a distinguished professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Emory and also um, uh, an executive associate dean for Emory at Grady. He's a professor of global health in the Department of Global Health, uh, professor of epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health. He's co-director of the Emory Center for AIDS Research and co-principal investigator of Emory uh, CDC HIV Clinical Trials Unit and the Emory Vaccine and Treatment Eva Evaluation Unit. Uh, but you, you probably know him because he's been one of the most visible, most trusted voices uh, in our community during, during the, the pandemic. And in addition to the public face, what I can tell you is he has spent countless hours briefing political leaders, elected officials, but also the business leaders of, uh, of our community. I have been to many of those uh, briefings, uh, Carlos, and I have seen really um, uh, CEOs of some of the largest companies really understand the, the, the situation we were in much, much better as a consequence of those briefings. So I can't thank you enough. By the way, uh, he has a very personal relationship with uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Walensky, and he is the president of my intelligence services, by the way. So now I... Now you've been uh, outed, I guess, as they say. Uh, my colleague, uh, Joshua Weitz, patent distinguished professor in the School of Biological Sciences. He also teaches physics and electrical and computer engineering. He's the director of the Quantitative Biosciences Graduate Program. He leads a multidisciplinary research team whose goal is to understand how viruses transform human health and the fate of our planet. He developed the epidemic models that would inform the design of Georgia Tech's surveillance program. He serves as a leader on the team analyzing the surveillance testing data. He's also the author of a risk analysis visualization tool that has been now used and really, I was gonna say that has spread throughout the world. Spread is now a bad word, so I, I need to check my vocabulary there, but it's a tool that is now being used by decision makers throughout the United States and in, in other countries as well. Um, and, and, and Pinar Keskino uh, Kak, Chuck uh, is a uh, William uh, Bill George Chair and Professor in the uh, Milton Stewart School of Industrial and Systems Engineering. She's the co-founder and director of the Center for Health and Humanitarian Systems. Um, her research focuses on the interconnection of pandemics and systems, including disease modeling for cholera, um, in, in malaria, epidemic flu, and other diseases. And uh, her recent work adopted the pandemic flu model for COVID-19. Uh, and looking at the effects in healthcare systems and supply chain. I think um, those, the three individuals that Anne is gonna help moderate, I think what they have in common is they, they share some of the traits that we have seen in, in the conversation today. Uh, the three of them have been uh, courageous. The three of them have uh, immediately turned their expertise and their scientific uh, tools to help all of us um, uh, to do better in, in to try to fight this, this pandemic. And by the way, when I tell you about uh, you know, how our faculty uh, came to us and said we have to test everybody every week and I had to pause for a second and try to understand what the implications were, it's them. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I'm very much appreciative of all the work that you have done. And with that, I leave you uh, to this panel. Thank you, Anne, for agreeing to moderate this group.
Thank you so much, President Cabrera. Yes, let's give these three a hand. And needless to say, President Cabrera, it is an honor. I am humbled to be here, not only because of this extraordinary honor for the Ivan Allen Social Courage Award, because that kind of prize, especially in these days where health is the preeminent conversation, I loved it how you, doc, Dr. Cabrera said the first question, have you had your vaccine? I even bring my card, two vaccines in more than two weeks. We got it together. But I think what I love about this panel is the brilliance of these three coming together as we talk about the what's next. How do we prepare for the next pandemic, which we know will be here? Each of these represents an amazing arc in the process. We know, they, they said I could call them by their first names because you know I'm the hugger and that's my way to hug is call you by your first name instead of honey or sweetie or something. So, so the wonderful thing is, Carlos has the idea of what is pandemic and the work in public health. And then Joshua brings together the amazing part of the testing as well as that whole community implementation, both on how do we know who has COVID and now how we do prevention of COVID through vaccine. And then I love it when we've got the whole idea here with Pinar is that she represents this supply chain and therefore the vaccine distribution. So together from the understanding of the pandemic and through public health, and I loved how Dr. Fauci said those two primary areas, we're not only building up our public health institution and systems, but also the science and the research that will get us to the better understanding to have the facts to be able to prevent and or understand how to be prepared for whatever comes next. So we're gonna ask them a couple of questions. I've told them all they're enthusiastic, quick, and punchy because they have the real essence of the hope for who we are as a community and especially today with social courage. These three have, have evidenced, that, evidenced it as well. So first, to you, Carlos, from your perspective, your vantage point, Tell me what you think is going to happen relative to being prepared for the next, whatever the next is. Well, you know, I think the first thing, Anne, is we have to acknowledge that we fail in this, in the response to this pandemic. And yet we thought we were prepared. We had pandemic plans. We had all sorts of, of things that, you know, in a global security index, the U.S. was ranked as number one as being the country most prepared and yet we have had the, the country with the biggest failure, right? We represent four, less than 5% of the world population. We're about 23, 24% of cases and of deaths. So obviously we have to recognize that we fail. And then we need to see, well, why did we fail? What parts we were not able to prepare for? And, and the number one failure we had as a country was a failure of leadership. And because leadership uh, is critical at a time of crisis and, and everybody in the business community knows that, and when you don't have the right leader at a time of crisis, then you're gonna fail. And unfortunately, you can't prepare for leadership. Leadership just happens when the pandemic occurs. So you're not, you can't say, well, let's plan my pandemic so it happens exactly when I have the real leadership that I need. So then you say, well, what could we have done? Well, the second thing is, is we, we weakened those institutions that were there to respond when, you know, when, when a pandemic happened. And that includes the CDC, that includes the FDA. And sidelining the CDC, in my mind, was particularly uh, an egregious mistake because it was, first of all, it's personal. Uh, it's, it's here in Atlanta. It's part of our community. It, these are our friends, our neighbors, but are people that we know. And we know the expertise and we know the, the, the value that's, that, that CDC has as a global health agency. And to see CDC essentially be moved out of the, of the, of the response from very early on, in my mind, was, uh, was clearly one of the greatest mistakes we made. And the, you know, the third one is that we, we did not lead, let science uh, uh, guide the response. We let politics right, guide the response. And, and as, as, as Dr. Jim Curran says, you know, public health has always been political. Politics is part of what we do. But, but it has never been partisan. And in my wildest dreams, I would have never dreamed that a face mask will become a political symbol. Mm -hmm. That a vaccine today, people are talking about whether there's more you know, 
hesitancy in Republicans or here or there. I mean, this, is, this doesn't make any sense. So making public health partisan, I think we made pe things that are technical political. And by doing that, I think we, we, we weaken our response. And then the last thing that I think we failed and something we really need to think about as a country is that our, our nation, our health system, our public health is typically run at the state level. You cannot run a pandemic response at a state level. This is a little bit like trying to run a war. You will not go to war and tell every state, well, you recruit your own soldiers, you get your own things, and then we'll meet you up in whatever Europe or where we're gonna fight because you know, we'll get there and see what we can do. We would have never won the Second World War had we done that. You know, here's the <laughs> Georgia army, here's the Massachusetts army, and th that's not how a country responds. And having had 50 different response plans throughout this pandemic, I think was a major problem. So the question really, the difficult question is at what point in time do you have a, a, a national strategy supersede, a and it, right, we're, we're living right now. I mean, the pandemic, the response to the vaccination is, is a mess, and it's a mess because every state has different requirements, every state has different responses. There's not a national plan. So I think at some point in time, we're gonna to have to look at those issues because if not, we will fail again in the next pandemic. But I love it, it's that whole leadership thread with the expertise, the science, and then the execution. So I love it. So thank you very much because that leads us to Joshua as we talk about testing and so beautifully looking at community implementation. What do you see? Well, we learned a lot from this pandemic and some of what we learned is that we had to build things on the fly. And so in thinking about where we are now, and it's important to keep mm -hmm. in mind, we're not done. And I think that's gonna be a theme we heard partly today. Yes, we are moving towards hopefully an end game, but we can't give up those things that have eventually been shown to work, like masking and distancing and testing as part of an integrative approach to keep cases down, even as we get immunity the right way, the safe way through vaccines. So when we look forward, I think that investment of the things that have worked have got to be in place earlier. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to reason given uncertainty, because what happens often early is we have to make decisions using limited data, but then the data is key. And if I go back in time about a year prior to now, some of the earliest understanding of person-to-person -person transmission was because of genomic surveillance data mm -hmm. that allowed us to see clusters that were not coming, let's say, from uh, a, an environmental source, but had the same signatures of individuals who had no connection to that source, indicating we have a human-to-human -human issue at hand. Without that surveillance, we would have even been farther behind. So once we are, uh, get those sort of surveillance systems in place, then we can start to see the value of more information. Testing people is not something that is a passive activity. What we've shown and many other institutions have shown is that testing can be a form of active mitigation. That not only are we getting data, that it's becoming part of decision support systems. And so I guess the last thought I would have with respect to the next, which is still now plus the next, <laughs> which is to really think about infrastructure development, both because we need to support basic science and principle development, but also because we need to reinvest in things like a national forecasting center. And not because we want that forecasting center to tell us the bad news and then the bad news comes and hits us, right. but because that supports new actions that we could be taking and eventually that's gonna to have to connect to community scales because the community partners are going to be essential if we're gonna take those principles, turn them into tools, and then eventually turn them into action. But I love here again the thread between Carlos and you is that you still have to, what we know is what we know today, and building on that in terms of the long-term leadership. And it's also between the two of you, it's the sort of the think, the think global, but it still has to act locally in terms of the communities in which those partnerships exist. And yet we need a national plan, directive, perfect. Because, right, Pinar, once we have a plan, we have to have it distributed. So let's hear a little bit about from your perspective on that whole supply chain and vaccine distribution when we have a plan, right? <laughs> so the first thing I would like to mention is that we really need to rethink the design of our healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. um, the pandemic highlighted the vulnerabilities, the gaps in those systems, 
they have been operating at fairly high capacity even before the pandemic because that's how they were designed. High utilization, minimized cost. And they were designed for the most part for sick care, not for health care, in part because of the financial incentives in place. So as we rethink, it's really important for us to redesign, rethink our healthcare systems to focus on promoting health, supporting healthy behaviors, putting incentives in place for healthy behaviors. So really shifting the focus from the sick care to healthcare. Um, the second thing I think the, the, the pandemic highlighted, this was mentioned uh, by my co-panelists as well as by, by Dr. Farci and Walensky, is the disparities. We have seen disparities, uh, you know, very, very glaringly in health outcomes, hospitalizations, deaths, uh, as well as infections uh, in uh, people of uh, color, uh, much higher than, than other communities. Um, so as we rethink the design of our healthcare systems, it's very important for us to also make sure that we have access and equity to everyone, regardless of their background, color, where they live, where, where they live uh, so that we can have a more equitable um, uh, access to these uh, services and healthier communities. Uh, so supply chains, um, again, the vulnerabilities in health supply chains, medical supply chains, uh, pharmaceutical supply chains, we've seen lots of issues during the pandemic. So uh, it's very important for us to first and foremost have the information, the vital information that we need so we understand what do we have where, what do we need, so that we can actually bring the demand and supply together, especially during a crisis. This, it's very difficult to do this on the fly, so you really need to have many of these in place ahead of time so that you are ready uh, when the crisis hits. And then the, the final thing that I would like to mention is the importance of collaboration and coordination between mm -hmm. different organizations, whether it's government, um, private sector, NGOs, academia. Um, and it's important to establish these collaborations, different roles, uh, connections ahead of time, because again, this is very difficult to establish uh, during a crisis situation. So our nation is, is, has been the leader in science, technology, but we failed in coming together, bringing things together and mobilizing our resources uh, for effective COVID-19 response. So, for future, I think this is another very important aspect for us to have uh, these connections and different pieces together. So when the crisis comes, uh, people know what they need to do, where, when, so that we can respond in an efficient and effective fashion. Ooh, what a difference a year makes from the point of all the unknowns and y'all putting it up together. And for those of us who were sitting in our homes on March 13th, oh, this will be done in two weeks, we'll be ready. And what we've seen over time, and we talk about literally what a difference a year makes, and of course Dr. Fauci mentioned that, is that today there's much more intention, there's focused, crossing the silos, collaboratives between the public and the not-for-profit, the NGOs, as well as the organizations like CDC and the Carter Center, is to bringing them together to focus on how we move forward instead of all scrambling. So I love that. Thank you, Pinar. And I think that's where so much of the, the difference in the year, back to leadership, focus, intention, resource allocation, and new ways of communicating that will be critical. Because what I think is if we look at the, not only how you prepare for the future, is where do we see bright spots, whether it's domestically or globally, that can make us think, oh, there is hope. There's some optimism out there, other than the difference in a year. And Pinar, I'm going to start with you this time. Where do you see hope? Um, some organizations have done a good job in making sure that uh, they operate safely, bring back their um, communities uh, safely. I think Georgia Tech um, has been one of those bright spots. Um, uh, like Dr. Cabrera, President Cabrera mentioned earlier, we don't have a public health school, we don't have a medical school, but we were able to implement um, uh, testing, tracing, isolation, um, and now vaccination. All of this is happening on campus. And I think the leadership uh, on campus has been key in making this happen, 
as well as the participation from everyone on campus, commitment from everyone on, on campus, students, faculty, staff, leadership. Um, and uh, the, the, I think uh, the, the way the leadership um, communicated openly to the community, broader community, as well as received input from various constitu constituents within our community, I think that has been key. Um, one of the reasons I love being at Georgia Tech and why I came to Georgia Tech is because of the collaborative spirit here. And I think this collaborative spirit shined probably like never before uh, with so many of us coming together um, during this time of crisis. Um, and I hope this uh, gives hope and um, sets a nice example for others as well. That is so cool. I love that story. And President Cabrera, you mentioned it where you said, well, we've never done it, but we'll do it, we'll do it. Let's do it, we'll just get it done, bring everybody to the table and get it done. So I think that spirit, the Georgia Tech way, needs to be expanded across many campuses as well as across the country. The collaborative, yes, out of our comfort zone, like Dr. Lindsay said, out of our comfort zone, we'll manage, move on. So tell us when you were talking about Joshua, your partner, I mean, yeah, your partner in crime here, how, where do you see hope? I don't want to steal Carlos's thunder by saying <laughs> vaccines. Can I say vaccines? Is he hope right here? Hope is sitting I, I, right I, next I, to us. Obviously, I am deeply optimistic about the change of direction here because of the widespread availability of highly effective vaccines. I think that should bring mm -hmm. all of us enormous hope and optimism. Now, with respect to lessons learned, now mm. the, the negative there would be we give up on the other items as those become available. So what has been a bright spot to me in this past six to nine months is precisely the way in which community members have come together often with very disparate expertise. So I wanna be clear, I'm sitting up here with colleagues today. There is a very large team, my colleague Greg Gibson in particular, uh, on the laboratory side, logistics folks who have figured out much more effectively than having me as your technician trying to figure out a way to make a saliva-based sampling uh, testing system fast and efficient and easy. A whole team of folks from communications to logistics to scientists who've come together in common purpose, in a sense of service, of trying to serve the community, inform the community, sometimes tell them when things are not going so well, mm -hmm. that we have to, even when things are going well, we have to be aware that that may not be the case a few weeks from now and that we have to remain vigilant. And I think those kind of interactions and collaborations can be the basis for improvements in the future, whether it's because we're going to be better prepared or even take that same collaborative spirit and develop a new technology in advance or a system in advance or even be more ready to communicate at scale, like this question of communicating risk in a different way so that people can take their own health into their own hands and try to make more informed choices. But going back to my first point, all of this now with respect to getting us through this non-pharmaceutical route, uh -huh. obviously all of the investment that was done very early, whether it's Moderna or Pfizer or J&J, are putting us in a much better place right now than we were even just a few months ago. This is both inspiring and informative. Thank you, Joshua, so much. I, I'm thinking about um, the story Dr. Fauci said about every single person in the scientific community has a part to play. They may think their part is very small, but in the big scheme, if it, we didn't have it, we wouldn't get where we are. So I love how you're talking about the team approach, the trusted approach, and how you communicate it. Okay, Dr. Del Rio. Now he's Dr. Del Rio. So, so what, what, what is the, uh, I mean, what are the bright spots? I mean, to me, the, the one bright spot and one we need to emphasize is, is the, the value and the triumph of, of science and of research. Uh, it is the investment in research that has gotten us vaccines and has gotten us to where we are. And I think we, you know, the U.S. spends a fair amount of, of a percentage of GDP in research through the NIH and through National Science Foundation, et cetera. And frequently you hear politicians say, well, why? What do we get out of this? Well, we get the kind of things like, like the vaccine we have right now. And I think telling the story about how supporting basic research actually has tremendous implications to where we are. So I think that... A bright spot has been that the, the investment of, of years in, in research has paid off, and I think has gotten us to a much better place. The, the second thing is I think that a, a bright spot has been 
the, the response of, of, of thousands of humans around the world. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I talk about many people, but I'm gonna refer right now to healthcare workers, uh, you know, who have, have been there in, in a very difficult circumstance and now for a year taking care of, of sick people and frankly being you know, tired and exhausted. And it's, it's been really, really hard when you have you know, people coming in that, that you have not much you can do once they get really sick and, and you know, five, six, seven percent of them are still dying in the hospital. And uh, it, it makes me think about the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jonathan Mann, who was the director of the national uh, of the of the Glo global program on AIDS many years ago, at an international AIDS, AIDS conference, he said back in 1998, he said, you know, when the history of AIDS, of AIDS is written, our biggest contribution may be that at the time of plague, we did not flee, we did not hide, we did not separate. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact mm -hmm. that people could have walked away and say, look, I don't need this job, I don't need to put myself at risk, I go somewhere else because there were, you know, there have been thousands of healthcare workers around the world who have gotten infected and people are still taking care of individuals. And I think, you know, the human condition, compassion, caring has really been prominent throughout this pandemic. And I think, again, we need to think about how do we capitalize on that? How do we get away from our individualistic selves and really move into a more, you know, sort of community approach to, because what Pinar was saying about health disparities, you know, health disparities are, are in great part, as Dr. Fauci said, the result of social inequalities Years. and and and, and, and and things that are happening in our society that we need to start caring about: housing, education, food access, many things that have nothing to do with with healthcare, but have everything to do with health. Mm -hmm. So, thinking about how do we address some of those things, I think, could potentially be some of the positive bright sides of this pandemic. Is that we may eventually, I think, come out of this really taking equity and, and, and justice as a much more serious thing that we've done up to now. And amen to that, as Dr. Fauci was even talking about the bright light, the shining the light on the entire community, which is a part of a health story. Whether you have the house in which to safely live, the food to remain your health, to be able to say, um, I begin to get educated. So you're, the whole community is so much a part of positive health as well as access to good health care. And I love how you said, obviously, as you heard from President Cabrera, I came from IBM and we were one of the largest research investors in the world. And to be able to know that that kind of research and patents and creative and innovative brains are working because that's what I loved about the work that was happening in the research arena where Kizzy Corbett was right there having worked on this with many of you over decades. Well, not she's young, but I mean, the work that had been going on for decades and it comes to fruition in times of need. So that's a part of that bright spot. But Carlos, you just mentioned a lot about why we're here, social courage. And for many of us, we've seen that in the face of the health workers, the health, the people who were taking care of the children of the health workers, the parents who've been at home during this time doing homeschooling, which is not an easy job. I'd love to, for you all to think about that and where have you seen social courage within either yourself or others and how did it impacted you, especially in light of the celebration today of, as I love Dr. Fauci, not just him, but all those that have been a part of this journey for the last year and actually as we've heard for decades. Carlos, would you like to answer that or respond to that? Well, I mean, I think you think about, you know, there's been many people that have talked about courage and the importance of courage, but I think about, you know, Winston Churchill and others, you know, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is really the ability to do the right thing in, on, in on, on difficult circumstances, right? And I think throughout this, this pandemic, you can put, you know, countless examples of people who have done exactly that. Uh, who have not remained quiet, who have uh, worked uh, very hard, who have stepped out of the, of, of the comfort zone mm -hmm. in order to do the right thing and work together uh, across uh, institutions, across nations, across uh, communities, uh, doing, you know, doing what needs to be done to address the pandemic. And in that, I think, to me, is, 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 is what the courage that we need. And we need, 
uh, more of that in our society because I worry that, that again, people are beginning to say, well, you know, this is over. When are we going to get back to, to the way things were? When are we going to get back to normal? And I tell people we don't want to go back to the normal that we lived at. We want to go forward in a much better normal. And that's going to take courage to do that. It's going to be, take courage to be disruptive and to be different. And I think we, you know, we're going to have to disrupt higher education. We're here in this, you know, in this uh, campus of Georgia Tech. I mean, how are we going to change our education going forward? What have we learned out of this pandemic? What can we do to make access to education more affordable and better to everybody as opposed to a, a few individuals? So I think using the pandemic as a way to to really leap, leap forward and get us to a better place is going to take enormous courage, and I think that all of us need to think about how do we do that. The whole new word is reimagining and a go-forward strategy. We don't have to just go back. It's to go forward. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Joshua, what have you been thinking about courage, social courage? Well, I think Dr. Fauci expressed it succinctly, which is that sometimes courage can mean telling the truth, speaking the science, telling the facts, however inconvenient. And about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago today, we hosted a rapid response forum at Georgia Tech in early February. And one of the speakers was Trevor Bedford. Now, some of you may know him. He's a, a genomic epidemiologist, in some sense, someone who does detective work by looking at sequences of viruses mm -hmm. and trying to understand origins. And he described seeing this pattern that seemed to indicate human to human transmission, and then spending all the time he could telling as many as people as possible. And then making a strategic decision to go spend much more of his time, he's a basic scientist, using a platform that really he had developed and was ready for this moment called NextStrain, to spend the time communicating and sharing exactly how severe this could be and how much action was needed. And so I think that's an example, it's, it's a different kind of brave, you might say, but in the, in the realm of science, this absolutely was that kind of decision, strategic decision to pursue evidence and truth and share it, even if it's inconvenient. And I think that kind of courage is infectious, let me say in a positive sense, mm -hmm. meaning when I saw that and I had seen his work on NextStrain, I thought a few years ago, why is he making websites? And then when I saw it a year ago, I said, I know why he's making, why aren't I doing more of that? Why aren't <laughs> others doing more things like that of translating? And we made strategic decisions here with a colleague, Cleo Andrus, in design and computing to try to take elements of risk that we felt were understandable, but then turn it into a tool that others could access, democratizing access to information in a way that people could make a decision. Is it actually risky to go in that crowd of 20 or 50? It was hard to make those sort of tangible decisions. So I think in that sense, that began to spread not just to me and my team, but to others in the team. And you can start to realize that that opportunity, it's challenging but how do we go outside our academic circles and really bring that out to the community? And that comes with risk, but it comes with real opportunities to make a bigger difference. Brilliant, because I think that's what so often people are hesitant to get out of their comfort zone, take the risk, ask the question, develop the idea with the intent or the fear. Fear often reigns in terms of giving us not as much um, confidence to take the risk. So I love hearing that, is that taking the risk and then having the application, a ripple effect. Brilliant, thanks Joshua. Pinar, what are you thinking about social courage and what effect it has on you? I mean, just, just to add um, a different perspective to, uh, to my colleagues, um, <coughs> I, I think about every single person in this country, in the world, um, during the pandemic, all the difficulties they are going mm -hmm. through it takes courage to wake up every day, to put one foot in front of the other and to keep going. Um, in the US, we lost about half a million people to COVID. That's a huge number. That's about the population of the city of Atlanta. Imagine an entire city wiped out. Um, probably each and every one of us lost a friend, a loved one, a family member, um, or know someone who did. So it's really, really, it's been really difficult uh, for I think every single person. Um, and um, I, you know, on the personal side, I would like to acknowledge my students, my graduate students in particular, 
the courage it took to them to stop what else they were doing and work day and night, especially during the uh, early months, uh, nonstop on COVID-related research um, because they cared and they wanted to make an impact. And, uh, you know, from our Georgia Tech community, again, earlier in the pandemic, there was a time when uh, we thought that some of the guidance that you were receiving from higher level organizations was not exactly sufficient for us to maintain safety on campus and to bring people back to campus. And a group of faculty members uh, got together um, following signs, uh, a lot of deliberation, wrote a statement uh, basically saying, um, we need to do things a little bit differently than you know, what we are hearing uh, to uh, establish and ensure uh, physical distancing, for example. So we need more flexibility in our modes of teaching and we need masks on campus. This was at a time when masks were not required or mandated, but we thought we really needed masks to make this a, a safe place. So it took courage for that group to come together to speak up uh, and uh, to be proactive rather than reactive uh, to ensure safety and health health and well-being of the, of the population. Oh, I think, unfortunately, our time is up, but you have heard three voices of courage who understand what it means from a global perspective of the folks affected and impacted by this COVID, but also the work that each of them have done over time. And to you, we're so grateful because it does exhibit the at-home real people that do courageous things every day. And to you, Carlos and Joshua and Pinar, I am so grateful and humbled to be on the stage with you and President Cabrera for letting us be on this stage to celebrate not just Dr. Fauci, but the brave souls who are working every day in community to be prepared for that next pandemic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You all are my hero sheroes. Thank you so much. Thank you. President Cabrera. Well, uh, let me add my appreciation to you and for the for moderating the panel to the to the three of you. Um, not not just for obviously for for this incredibly interesting and insightful conversation, but most importantly for what you have been doing this year. And uh, and I think all of you mentioned it, and 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 I do recognize that there's a lot of people behind you and in other groups and throughout Georgia Tech and throughout universities around the. The, the country, but um, I am grateful to everyone, each one of you. And let this moment be a reminder to all of us of uh, what an incredibly important function uh, we have as, as universities dedicated to research, to educating new generations. Think about it, there's no other institution in our society that can do the kinds of things that we are called to do. Let this be a reminder that it's not always easy, it's not always pleasant, but it's absolutely essential that we deliver on our mission. Thank you all very much for being with us today. Much appreciated.